Hi folks, this is uh, Richard Hall and uh, this is uh, the night sky and we're not going to have any pictures today because what we're going to do is chatting about different ideas and so on and I thought what we would do is actually we often as astronomers we're so used to the familiar jargon that we use about stars, nebulae, we assume that everybody knows what they are but so what we thought we'd do today is actually talk our way through what we're actually talking about and what we're actually looking at. So let's start off by the word stars, looking at the stars. Well, what is a star? Okay, well, the best idea to get an idea of what a star is, is that big shiny thing that's uh, out in our sky, the sun. The sun is a typical star, all right? And, uh, okay, so it's a star, but it, when you look at other stars, it's really looking like looking at other all sorts of other things like animals and so on they have all different sizes shapes and distances so the stars vary in distance and they vary in brightness because a star is big and bright could mean that it's close to us but it also might mean that it's a very very bright star shining out over thousands of light years all right so when we look up at the night sky what we're seeing is all these different suns but we've got no idea what their distances and true characteristics are. Not with our eyes. No, not well, with Well, very little with our no, eyes, put no, it that way. You no. can tell some of them. Mm. Well, what I'm placing you back is in the position of what it was our ancestors were looking at thousands of years ago, okay? Uh, now, we also talk about constellations. A constellation is a, originally it was just a pattern of stars in that familiar pattern of stars, so people could find their way around. These days, of course, astronomers are divided up in the sky, which we still call constellations, into particular areas. But a constellation is just a pattern. But the important thing to remember when we're talking about a constellation is that it's something that we can see from here. And also the constellations that we often talk about, they're actually a universal system, aren't they? But each culture had their own constellations. Oh, and yes. they're valid for their culture. But if you were talking to somebody on the other side of the world, for instance, you'd have to use the kind of universal one. Well, as, as we often talk about at Stonehenge, I mean, the, the constellations, particularly those of the Zodiac, are so named, not because they look like a bear or a giraffe in the sky, or whatever it is called. It's because when those stars rose up, it marked a particular seasonal event that was going to occur. All right, so for, uh, I always point out like a good one is Aquarius, so-called, not because it looks like a man pouring water out of an urn, but because when those stars rose up in the dawn 5,000 years ago, it held the onset of the rain mm. season. But for the international thing, if I said crooks to a person in Russia, they still know that that's the cross. Yes. If right. I use the proper name of the international, whereas it's got other names, it's got Maori names, it's probably got names from other cultures as well. But if I said those to them, they may or may not know what I was talking Absolutely. about. Absolutely. Mm. Look, it's a good example is Mataliki, all right? Uh, long, I, saw, I was brought up in England, long before I even heard the word Mataliki, I knew the, uh, the Pleiades as the Pleiades star cluster, the Seven Sisters, all right? That's what it's known. Uh, but if you went to India, they were called Kritika, the Kritika, all right? These stars were important to people around the world because they rose up at a certain point in time which marked a major seasonal change. And indeed, it marked the beginning of the year for the peoples of Europe and Asia thousands of years ago. And, and that's a tradition in, that's in been... In Japan, uh, they're known as Subaru. Subaru, yes. Yeah. And in turn, that tradition has then been taken down by the Polynesians down into, into New Zealand. That's so. right. Yeah. But when we, when we try and talk to someone else from someone else, we need to use the international name so that they know what we're talking about. Yeah, that's right. Or at least include them in our description so yeah. that they know that when we say Matariki, we're referring to the Pleiades. Yeah, mm. absolutely, yeah. And the, the other thing to bear in mind is that stars are so far away in our sky uh, that they just, they are literally points of light. They don't, they haven't got any dimensions. So, and even with the largest telescopes now, we're just beginning to get to the stage where we can actually photograph the actual physical object of a star. See the actual disc of the Yes, star. of what it was, yeah. That's quite an achievement. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You showed them that last week, wasn't it? It was uh, 
Aldebaran, wasn't it, that you yeah. were showing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's right. Uh, so you've got that sort of problem that the, the, the brightnesses and sizes are very, very different, all right? Okay. Um, the other thing to bear in mind, our sun is a single star. And also, I should go before I go on, the planets, all right? Now, planet means a wandering star because for our ancestors, a planet didn't look any different from a star. It was just a bright star object up there, which, unlike ordinary stars, moved around. And of course, it moves around the zodiac, which is the plane of the solar system. All right? So, uh, but then, then once we identify what the real stars are, all right? so, but what we discover is that many of the stars out there are not single stars. So the nearest star beyond the solar system right, is the Alpha Centauri system, which is a system of two stars, two suns. And it's not, a further one is a red dwarf, but two bright stars, both of them very similar to the sun. So if you lived on a planet in the Alpha Centauri system, and indeed we know there are planets there, you'd have two suns in the sky instead of one. Yeah. Alpha Centauri is the brighter of the two pointers pointing at the Southern Cross. That's right, yeah. Yes, and you can go out and have a look at it tonight. It just looks like one star. Yeah, but even in a small telescope, and you don't need much more than a small telescope, you can see it as a double star. And the two stars orbit around each other in a period of about 60 years or something like that. Yeah. Yes, I've, I've seen those through, uh, through my telescope. Yeah. The, uh, you can actually see the separation between the yeah. two stars. Yeah. And uh, which you can't with with uh, with naked eye. Mm. And of course, any planets there would be orbiting around the individual star. So if you were orbiting around one of the stars, as you orbited around, sometimes you would have two suns in the sky. At other times, when one sun sun set, the other one would rise. Okay. Mm. Uh, but some of them have got even more suns. Oh, absolutely. That's just an example. Uh, you know the the Gemini, the two bright stars in Gemini, which are in our sky at the moment. Which right? is the twins. Yeah, the yeah. twins. Yeah, uh, Castor, the white one, is actually a system of six stars. So if you lived in the Castor system, you'd have six suns. Right? You're probably more likely to orbit a little bit further out, aren't you? Yeah. What, what you've actually got is, is, is three binary stars. You've got each of them is a binary, two stars okay. orbiting around each other. And then what you've got is the uh, one pair of binaries orbiting around each other as, a, as if they were single stars. And then at a greater distance, another pair, which is orbiting around those two. I sometimes <laughs> like to think of um, the six paired stars of Castor as being like three pairs of dancers on a dance floor. Yeah. And they're all da they're all dancing around each other and you know, um, uh, you've got these three couples dancing around each other and you've also got this motion where they're moving around the dance floor as well. Yes. Yeah. So, it's, so it's quite it's quite a complicated movement. Yeah. But uh, I can also imagine on a hypothetical planet um, orbiting the stars of Castor, um, they you can you can imagine they probably attach some sig religious significance to the all positions of these oh, suns absolutely. That they see, in their, yeah. they see in their sky. That's right. This is the point I'm trying to make: is that if you were a different point in the universe, even low, not any great distance, all the constellations that you recognise here from Earth would disappear mm. because it's the viewpoint we've got. You know, once you move out there, you, you, the patterns of stars will be somewhat different because you change your position, the type of star you're orbiting around is different, and so on. So each civilization that may be out there, their view of the universe is a little bit different to ours, isn't it? You know? Now, the other thing to bear in mind is that those stars vary. Now, vary in size and mass. They're not all, the, although the sun's a star, not all stars are like our sun, all right? So the stars themselves are physically changing in size and mass. Yeah, well, what you've got is when stars are formed, all right, they form at different masses, and depending upon their mass is how big and bright they are, okay? So star, a star that's a lot more massive than our sun will be hotter and brighter. Reverse, a smaller star will be uh, cooler. And, and redder. And in fact, the most common star in the universe, accounting for something like over 50%, 60% of all the stars in the universe are red dwarfs, small red white, red stars. And not one of them can be seen with the unaided eye from here. And yet they're the most common star in the universe. And the nearest is Proxima Centauri, which is a little red dwarf star. Yeah. And conversely, the largest ones 
are oh. blue white, aren't they? Or oh, yeah. Almost white. Yeah. And we can see those quite easily oh, from yeah, a yeah. very great distance. But they look. At, I mean, a good example in our sky at the moment is Rigel. Right? You know, it is a brightish star, but it's um, it's in it's a, over seven hundred light years away, and thousands and thousands of times brighter. And I've got some of the limits here. The smallest mass star that you can have would be uh, eight percent the mass of the sun. Well, that's about that's. I, that's five times the mass of Jupiter, right? Yes. So, so when stars are forming, if you get an object that's got a mass of less than 8% of, of the Sun, it simply doesn't turn into a star. We'll talk about that in a moment. So it's a planet? Well, yeah, or a brown dwarf or something like that. We, we, we'll talk about that in a second. Okay. And the maximum is around about 150 times that of the Sun, right? Mm. And, and indeed, a star like that would uh, be uh, very energetic. To give you an example, the smallest mass star, if you could actually find a star that was only 8% the mass of our sun, its brightness would be one four hundred thousandth that of the sun. Right? So, and it would be a very red star. At the other end of that star, if we find that one that's 150 times, uh, it would be uh, 500 million times brighter than the sun. Uh -huh. That's a very bright star. Yes. Well, notice uh, something that's, so we say, double the mass of the sun is not twice as bright. It's something like the fourth pair, so like 16 times brighter. So the more massive a star is, the quicker it uses up its mass. So if the sun was twice as massive as it is now, it would have already have burnt out. Is that why you can't get any bigger? Because it would already have be so unstable that it just... At that point, yeah. That's right. Well, form. I've got it listed yeah. down here. The estimate... A bright, star that bright has never been found because they don't live long. Do you know how long they live if they have that mass? No. Of a mass? 2,700 years. <laughs> and that might sound a lot to you, but to the life expectancy of our sun, which is about 9 billion years, it's pretty small. You know? Yes. Yes. Uh, so and it'd be unstable, wouldn't it? <laughs> oh, yes. Mm. Yeah, you wouldn't want to be anywhere near that thing, yeah. Okay. So it was like connecting, uh, like, uh, sorry, having different uh, sized engines, yeah. power engines, connected to a particular, you know, a given amount of uh, yeah. uh, fuel in the tank. Yeah. And a little engine from a, um, from a Mini or something like that would run for ages, yeah. but a big um, top fuel dragster engine would run for about a minute and then run mm. fuel. It's, it's, it's the same principle. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So, uh, if we want to look at the opposite end of the spectrum while we're here, the smallest stars, things like Proxima Centauri, life expectancy, 300 trillion years. So you see the old Proxima out there, it's a little faint red star, but it's going to be shining away billions and billions of years after our sun has died out and all the other bright stars around it. Yeah. 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 So something, something to bear in mind is that longevity. And so the stars vary in, in, in colour uh, as you look up there. Now, the human eye, has got, you've got two types of cells in your eye, the rods and the cones. Right? Now, the rods give you the sharpest vision, right? But they only give you black and white vision. So when you use your rods, you're only seeing black and white. The cones give you colour, right? Now at night, as it begins to get darker, you might notice all the colours around you begin to disappear. It's because your, your brain is depending upon, and the eyes are depending upon the rod cells and not the cones, which is shutting down, because there's not enough light to stimulate the cones. Now exactly the same thing applies when you look up there at the stars. In most cases, stars are so faint that it's not, they're not triggering the cone cells. So, so all the stars appear to be white, right? But that's not true. If you look at the brighter stars, you begin to see some have got catalysts. Like if you look at the Orion right now, you've got Betelgeuse, which has got a definite it's orange and yellow. Yes. Yes. yes, and you'll find that. You look through a big telescope and bam, it suddenly strikes you that these stars are different colours. And particularly when you look at double stars, where there's two suns, which are different masses. And my favourite one, ever since I really got me hooked into astronomy, was back in England when I first looked through the telescope at a star called Albirio. Right? And what you got is a yellow star, and a, which literally appears golden yellow, 
and its companion star is sapphire blue. It looks like a sapphire. So you've got this golden yellow and sapphire star. And they look absolutely magnificent. They look like two contrasting jewels. Yeah, that's right. And you can imagine what it would be like on a planet around these stars. They appear very different to here. So yeah. you were looking through a telescope, weren't you, which enabled yeah. you to catch more light. Because there's more light and coming. And fired up those cone cells. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's what happens. It fires up the cone cells and suddenly you can begin to see all those those colours up there. Now, Kay, you, you were talking a little bit earlier about, um, you know, what happens to a thing that's not over over 8% of the mass of the sun. Oh, yeah. Well, we, what we do know is stars are not formed singularly. They're always formed in clusters. And if you look along the Milky Way, you'll see lots of star clusters. That invariably tells you that they're actually baby stars. And in time, the clusters disintegrate, right? And then just travel on their journey, individual journeys around the sun, right? right? But looking out at these things, at the smallest, there will be the smaller stars are the more common, Right. So what happens to them? They become brown dwarfs. The ones that are smaller than that 8% mass become what we call brown dwarf. A true star, as far as scientists explain it, is where the temperatures and pressures are so great at the centre that you've got a nuclear furnace where hydrogen, which is the most common element in the universe, is converted into, into helium. That's exactly what we do in a hydrogen bomb. Yeah, it's a thermonuclear reaction. That's right. So essentially, the sun is a gigantic hydrogen bomb. Yes. And I think the, the rate of uh, something like 4 million tonnes of matter per second right, is being uh, converted into, from hydrogen to helium. <laughs> but that might sound a lot, but the sun's so big it can carry on doing it for a long period of time. But when you get a very small mass star, it doesn't have sufficient mass to trigger that nuclear reaction. You remember it's not a star, it's a brown dwarf. It's the brown dwarf. Mm. And so it, it's going to be hot and it will shine for gravitational contraction for a long, long period of time, right? But uh, it will never trigger nuclear... So it's got a heat furnace, yeah. not a thermonuclear yeah. furnace. Yeah. yeah. So to give you a, actually quite interesting example, if you take the planet Jupiter, which is the biggest so planet, it's, Jupiter's bigger than all the other planets put together, right? And its composition is more like a star than it is a planet. It's made mostly of hydrogen and helium. Jupiter actually radiates more energy than it receives from the sun. And that's that radi it's very, very low energy. But it, the thing is, that's what's happening. Right? So that's what you get up with a brown dwarf if you just cools down into a, a giant, giant Jupiter, as it were. Okay? Yeah. But when you're saying giant, you don't actually necessarily mean much bigger in size. You mean bigger in mass. Bigger in mass, yeah, because it will Because it squashes yeah. its mass. That's right, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you've got a planisphere or something, and they show the brighter stars by showing them bigger. But in actual fact, sometimes the actual size um, is not so much bigger as more squished. Though some of the very big stars, of course, are bigger. Massively right, bigger. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah, they are. OK, so you've got the brown dwarfs. Now, now the other interesting thing, of course, is, that, um, is, the, is the longevity of stars. You see, if a, st if, if a star, I said, is, is more massive, it's more energetic, but it's not numerical. Like it's to the fourth power. So consequently, the bigger a star is, the brighter it is, but the shorter it lives, right? Yes. OK, so uh, um, a star like our sun has got enough mass to radiate energy or convert hydrogen to helium for about 9 billion years, right? But when you look at the really big stars out there, they're, they're, their life expectancies are just in a few millions of years and so on, right? And while the little red dwarfs will virtually last forever, all right? So that's something else to it, why we don't have vast numbers of big bright stars out there, uh, because uh, they use up their energy and they die. And uh, what happens when a star begins to run out of its, its hydrogen helium? Well, in the case of a star like our sun, it's going to turn into a red giant. It will expand in, and start increasing in energy. So instead of as the sun begins to run out of energy, getting cooler and fainter, what is going to happen is it's going to brighten. 
right? And it will expand. It expands into a red giant. So our sun could end up around about 100 times brighter than it is at the moment. So goodbye, Earth. That's yes. <laughs> but if it's red, it's actually... a. You're saying it's expanding and it's hotter, but the energy that you're looking at is more in infrared, isn't it? That's right, infrared and red, yeah, because the yeah. thing it expands yeah, the layers are further yeah. away from the core. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Mm. Yes. And then eventually, after, the, after it's used up all its energy, it, the, the uh, outer layers get puffed away. And, and that gives us, we see these things out, out there in the universe. They have those beautiful coloured discs yeah. around them of different nebulous, different yeah. rings yeah. exactly that's what they are these are the uh, planetary nebulae yeah yes. and then what you end up with is um, a white dwarf mm. which is the white hot cinder of what was the core of that star which over millions and millions of years slowly cools away right mm. yes. and, but that little cinder right it's only about the size of the earth but it contains a, a huge amount of mass, you know, almost equivalent to the sun's initial mass, right? But it's all compressed into an object that... No that actually, is that what they refer to as the diamond? You know, it's actually like diamond. Well, that's right, you see, because what's... It's carbon. What's in the, many of them, what's left at the centre is actually carbon, and as it compresses, it turns into a diamond, but a diamond the size of the Earth, you know. A twinkle, twinkle little star is right, really, if yeah. you're talking about them. Yeah. <laughs> but as, as I say to people, we don't ever think, oh, I'm going to go out, because we the first white dwarf was discovered around the brightest star that's in the sky at the moment. It's a double star. Sirius? Sirius, and its companion is a white dwarf. Now, the fact that, that always with a binary star, they both form together, this tells you that once upon a time, the f companion star, which we can't see now without a powerful telescope, was bigger. Was bigger and brighter, and it's mm. gone through its lifetime quickly. And all that's left is that uh, that white dwarf, which is cooling down. But if you imagine sending, going out on an expedition, mining expedition to mine the diamond. I'm afraid that if you landed on the surface of that, even when it's cooled down, you'd have the unpleasant um, experience of weighing at least a hundred thousand tons, and your body would collapse <laughs> so rapidly. Raspberry jam. You would be more than that. You'd be spread over an area. That <laughs> size of a football field. <laughs> yeah. it's, a big, it's a big price to pay for yeah. uh, trying to dig out a piece of diamond off the surface uh, of the court. That's right, yeah. So those, those white dwarfs, again, they are so faint that not one can be seen. But you could have heaps of them out there, and if, they're, if they've cooled down enough, you wouldn't be able to tell they were there, would you? That's right, yeah. No, you wouldn't, no. Yeah. And of course, the, at the other extreme, the big giant stars are a bit different. When they end, they literally explode, all right? So when you look at Rigel and Betelgeuse and things, they will end their life in a massive explosion, which is called a supernova. Yeah. Yes. And what is often left then is either what we call a neutron star or a black hole. Right? The supernova, by the way, is the most titanic yeah. explosion. Yeah. Um, that, we've, that we've, we've ever witnessed in the universe. Yeah. You can get hypernovas, can't you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Which yeah. are even bigger. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. That's right. So what a bit perspective ca uh, candidates out there at the moment looking up in the sky is when you look at the constellation of Orion, is Betelgeuse, is a red supergiant, and it's expected to turn supernova in the near future. Now, the near future could be tomorrow or you know, a million years from now, but uh, that's on stellar terms, all right? And you, some of you may remember a little while ago, people started getting concerned that you were getting these vessel jewels were becoming really unstable, it was fluctuation in brightness, and they thought it was going to turn supernova, but it's now stabilised up again. But sooner or later, it will explode, yeah. Yes. <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to leave at the moment, because I've, I've got to, for those of you may notice me on TV, I've got this scar here, and I've got to go down to have some stitches taken out, all right? So I've got to go down to the hospital at the moment. So I'm going to leave you in the good hands of Keith, who's going to be carry on talking about, oh, I don't know, whatever you like to talk about, Keith. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, mate, you take over, okay. Thank you, Keith. You're welcome, thank we you, Rich again, thank you, Richard and Kay, and We'll be going for the next uh, 10 minutes. I'm Keith Austin, and 
we have... Um, Oh, well, I'm going to carry on talking about what Richard was talking about with the uh, the stars, but one thing that he didn't mention, uh, he only mentioned briefly, were the colours of the stars. Now, even naked eye, if you look out, look out at the stars, you can see most of them are white. They they have a just a white look to them, which is fairly common. But you notice some of them have a slight bluish tinge to them. And some of them, like uh, the aforementioned Betelgeuse, or Betel Betelgeuse, to use the American pronunciation, uh, Betelgeuse is an orange-red star in Orion, and Aldebaran, which is a star in uh, Taurus, which you can also see in the evening, evening sky. And they have an orange look to them, uh, just a slight orange look to them. Alpha Centauri, which is uh, one of the two pointers that points towards the Southern Cross, is a uh, slightly yellowish looking star so we do have these colors and you can you don't need any astronomical instrument to see them you can do this with with the naked eye but what those stars are telling you is the temperature they um uh as the temp uh, d stars have different temperatures and those temperatures are reflected in their colors uh when i was doing blacksmithing working in a forge i uh, learnt to tell the temperature of the metal, the billet of iron that I was working with, by the te by the colour it put out. As you heat it up, you heat a piece of metal in a forge or a furnace, and first it glows very deep cherry red, then it gets brighter red, then it gets to orange, then it gets to yellow, then it falls apart. Okay, if I could keep on heating that piece of metal, it would start to glow white, and then blue and then violet and then it would start glowing in the ultraviolet now this is what stars do a cool little cool star like the red dwarf that richard was talking about they would glow in the infrared which is below red a little bit brighter they glow in red a um, little bit brighter and hotter you get orange stars then you get the yellow stars which are like our own lovely beautiful warm sun then you get the white stars which are hotter still then the big massive blue white stars and again you can just look up at the stars in the sky without uh, needing any telescope or anything and you can tell their temperatures um, so you can see that the smaller stars have that uh, yellow look to them. The bigger stars have the mi big massive stars, uh, this wonderful sparkly blue white colour. The difference of course is that the orange red stars ironically enough are actually huge. They're really really big stars like Betelgeuse which is why we can see them. This is because there are two types of red stars. You get the red dwarfs which are the tiny ones that we can't see naked eye and there are trillions and trillions and trillions of these red dwarfs. Um, you can't see them with the naked eye, um, but they glow in the red and they will be glowing red for trillions of years, as Richard said. The other kind of red star is the degenerate star, a big star that has basically reached the end of its life and running out of fuel, and what happens at blows its entire atmosphere to pieces. The, it puffs off the atmosphere and as the atmosphere cools it's drawing away from the core like that and then you get because it's cooling that big red look to the uh, to the star. So I'm going to finish shortly we've just got a few minutes to go but the um, the thing is with this with the way that the uh, stars work um, of course uh, a friend of mine we, we were looking up at the stars once and uh, she, she actually asked me you know what actually is it that makes the stars shine and as richard pointed out um uh, briefly before it is actually a thermonuclear explosion now i'm not going to get too technical here but briefly what this means um is that you've got incredible pressure 
inside the core of the star. All the outer layers of the star are crushing it so much that the hydrogen atoms, there's hydrogen inside the, inside the core of the star, the hydrogen atoms are actually being squeezed together like that. And when you squeeze two hydrogen atoms together, you get a helium atom. But the point is that a helium atom is slight weighs ever so slightly less than two hydrogen atoms squeezed together. So you actually have a slight excess of weight. So what does it do? What does the helium atom do? It has to lose that weight in the form of energy. Uh, I'm going to get just very technical here. Einstein's famous equation E equals mc squared simply tells us that energy is the same as mass. So if you squeeze two hydrogen atoms together, you get one helium atom plus a little burst of energy. And that energy is the thermic part of the thermonuclear reaction that makes the star that makes the sun shine, and that makes the stars shine. So anyway, I'm going to go now and uh, Big thanks, by the way, to uh, Richard and Kay for inviting me along to all these uh, sessions. Uh, I always enjoy talking um, talking with people about uh, about astronomy, about the stars, the planets. The, there's many de many amazing denizens of the deep out out there in in, in deep space, as we know. So um, don't uh, forget, by the way, uh, if you happen to be in the wire wrapper do come in to uh, Stonehenge Oturaro it's um, out near Martinborough uh, look on the website uh, on the Phoenix Astronomical website or even just Google Stonehenge and you will see um, you see where it is I can tell you it's an amazing place uh, to work there Richard and Kay are both absolute fountains of knowledge uh, about uh, the stars about mythology all that sort of thing so uh, don't forget Come along to Stonehenge Aotearoa and um, have a chat. You can have a chat with Richard and Kay. They're very, very uh, talkative people. <laughs> okay. So anyway, that's me. I'm off. Uh, my name's Keith and I'm signing off now. And we'll see you again in two weeks' time. Okay. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and goodbye. <laughs>